Jesus said, There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abram far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abram, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abram said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here, from here to you, cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abram, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Which do you think Jesus spoke more about? Prayer or money? If you think money, you'd be right on target. Why? Wasn't he a spiritual leader? Of course he was. And that's why he knew that one of the most powerful forces exerting its influence on us is the pull of wealth. It tugs on our heart, it tugs on our mind, it tugs on our soul. The desire for wealth and the resistance to sharing it have probably led more people away from God than anything else. Today's parable from the Gospel of Luke paints this stark contrast between a rich man and a poor man. And as the stories of Jesus often do, it contains exaggerated details to underscore its point. We read that the rich man dressed in purple and fine linen. Now in the ancient world, if anyone said someone dressed in purple, that just screamed expensive. The purple dye trade was centered in the Phoenician city of Tyre, that's located in present-day Lebanon. Dye makers had to extract from a particular sea snail a purple-producing liquid. They had to crack open the shell, extract this liquid, and then expose it to sunlight for a precise amount of time. 
Moreover, it took thousands of snails to produce one ounce of usable dye. Thus, purple was exorbitantly expensive. However, the rich man not only had this fabulous wardrobe, the text also tells us he ate sumptuously every day. Now, most people in first century Palestine existed on a very meager starch diet. Only occasionally would they be able to sit down at a table to something that anyone would call a feast. Yet this man, we are told, gorges himself daily. The other man in the story has a name, Lazarus. He is at the opposite end of the economic spectrum. He is not merely identified as poor, but we are told that his body is covered with sores. He is so destitute that he longs to just get a few scraps that fall from the rich man's table. He is so weak and impoverished that dogs come and lick his sores. Jesus paints a scene that is intended to repulse us. As Jesus continues with his tale, he says, both men die, but both men do not end up in the same place. The rich man ends up in hell where he is tormented. Lazarus is carried by the angels into heaven where he stands at the side of Abraham, the father of all Jews. The rich man begs Abraham to please send Lazarus to him with just a fingertip of water to cool his tongue. But Abraham says, no, I'm sorry, there is this great chasm between us. No one can cross it. The wealthy man knows that his brothers will end up suffering the same fate if they do not change their ways toward the poor. And so he pleads with Abraham to warn them. Abraham points out they already know what to do. Moses and the prophets instructed people on how to treat those in need. It's a haunting parable with a crucial message. When those who, fail, who, when those who have fail to share with those who have not, it creates a great gulf between God and those who withhold. Now keep in mind that the wealthy man did not commit a heinous act. When he walked through his front gate, he did not curse Lazarus. He never ordered his servants to go out there and drag that poor man away from the front of his house. No, his was a sin of omission, and he had no excuse for his behavior. He knew he was obligated to take care of the poor man lying at his gate. Not only were there ample Jewish commands to treat those who are hurting with justice, one's obligation to the poor was spelled out in very unambiguous language. We read in Deuteronomy 15, part of the Mosaic Law, if there is anyone among you in need, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted you should rather open your hand willingly, lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Be careful that you do not view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so, for on this account the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake since there will never cease to be some in need on the earth, I therefore command you, open your hand to the poor and needy. The wealthy man could not feign ignorance, and neither could his brothers. Father Abraham, he cries out, warn my brothers so they don't end up in hell with me. What's Abraham's response? They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. 
In the 16th century, commenting on this passage, Martin Luther wrote, The rich man's life glitters and shines beautifully, but his sheep's clothing conceals a wolf inside. The parable does not accuse him of adultery, murder, robbery, or violence, or of doing anything that the world would censure. But we must look into his heart and his spirit. And that is where the problem is. He has no heart for his neighbor. Pastor Chris Tuttle remembers when his high school youth group took a trip and they went to the Church of the Pilgrimage in Washington. One evening they brought in several homeless men to share their stories with the teenagers. One of the students asked one of the men what to do if someone from the street approaches him and asks for money. The man said, do what you feel like doing. Just know that if you give him money, it may go for food or it may go for something else. Follow your instincts, he said, as you make that decision. But then he added the critical point. He said, say yes or say no, but treat me like a person. We spend our days not being seen. Do not act like we're not even there. While they were alive, the rich man never even noticed Lazarus. He did not speak to him as he entered or exited his house. He did not share even the little scraps that were falling from his table. He acted as if Lazarus was not even there. He painted himself some alternative reality, one devoid of a poor person lying at his gate. The rich man was badly in need of a conversion. He needed to be converted from life is about me to life is about us. He needed to be converted from you have to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps to we're all in this together. He needed to be converted from if I give away some of what I have, I'll have less to if I give away some of what I have, I'll have more. He needed to be converted from success is measured in terms of quantity of shekels to success is measured in terms of quantity of compassion. He needed to be converted from indulging myself is good for my soul to giving away a portion of my wealth is what's really good for my soul. In nearly 40 years of ministry, I've been convinced that one of the greatest measurements of a person's spiritual life is their financial giving. People do not give away their money if there's not a compelling reason. However, if you know that God is in the business of transforming people's lives, if your life has been transformed and you've seen transformation happen in other people's lives, then you want to do what you can to change people and to change the world. For the next 15 seconds, I want you to think about your personal worth. Go. All right, 
How did you think about your personal worth? Did you think about what you are worth financially? Or did you think about what you are worth to your family and friends and community? Personal worth is an interesting phrase, isn't it? Sometimes we forget or downplay our worth, our value to others. You are valuable in terms of emotional support. You probably have people who rely on you to lift their spirits. You may be valuable in terms of knowledge or wisdom. Some may turn to you for some advice. If you're a parent, you have enormous worth to your children. They depend on you to teach them, to love them, to support them, to guide them, no matter how old they are. Mine are in their 40s, and believe me, they are still counting on my personal worth. When you write a check, or use your credit card, or debit your account, your financial assets decrease. However, if your money goes to someone in need, your personal worth increases. Watch your mailbox this week, because the stewardship letter is coming your way. When you receive it, I hope you'll just take a few moments to ponder your personal worth and how it will multiply with your financial gifts to Westminster. Because our community of faith touches our lives and touches so many other people's lives in critical ways. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that Westminster will continue to have worship services every Sunday with a marvelous choir who sings inspiring music, an extraordinary organist who makes our hymns soar. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that we'll have challenging and thought-provoking classes that will stimulate your thought and deepen your faith. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that there'll be programs for our children where they'll learn the stories of faith, where they'll learn that God loves them, and where they will learn that God has a purpose for their lives. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that we will have these ministries that help feed the poorest in our community, that house homeless families, they give rides to people when they need to get to a doctor's appointment and where we can provide a safe place to gather for tutoring for children who come from some of the toughest neighborhoods in our community. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that there will be ministries that build friendships between us and people living in Guatemala and the Congo and the Holy Land. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that we'll be able to provide a meeting place for people who are struggling with addictions and parents who need help improving their parenting skills. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that when someone faces a crisis, there'll be a pastor there. And when a loved one dies, there'll be a service to celebrate their life and to witness to the resurrection. Boost your personal worth by ensuring that there'll be a place to celebrate weddings and a place for us to bring our children and grandchildren to be baptized into the church. The rich man in Jesus' parable was so badly in need of conversion he needed to know in his body, mind, and soul that his personal worth was about so much more than what he had. He needed to know that what you know, and that is that our personal wealth, 
our true wealth is tallied by what we give.